lucky to really, by chance, fall into a period in movie making when these directors were around and wanted me. And that has been a sort of miracle of my career because I haven't made that many pictures. But they were all, one after the other, four great directors yes. and with great actors. I, I was not an actress when I came to movies, I was a dancer. So I had no experience. I had experience in working, working hard, ballet is hard, discipline. Those were the things I could contribute. I wasn't a tearing beauty. I didn't have a, any way for them to know of whether I could really act. But in Willie's sensitivity, in Billy's sensitivity, they realized there was enough there for them as a human being to draw out. And that has been my limitations also. I've never been able to declaim Shakespeare or do those kind of things. What I'm really trying to say is I never really became an actress. Do you know what I'm trying to say by that? Mm -hmm. I never did the repertoire in the theater or the whole gamut in movies. You know, it was a sort of miraculous period in my life when I was in the hands of these people. And I was born with something that appealed to an audience at that particular time. And it, that's why it, it's, it never ceases to, to puzzle and yet also to, to dazzle me in a way that mm -hmm. everything has happened to me. Let me just suggest to you that what you did on screen was not easy to do, and you appealed to men mm -hmm. and women like I think no other actress that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Women admire you and want to be like you. Uh, for men, you're, you're an ideal woman. And you can say that you've never done the Shakespeare and so forth, and mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. And I, I would submit to you in all humility that there are different definitions of actress. And mm -hmm. that if you want to take a classical definition of somebody who can go out and do a ripping job of Lady Macbeth, well, maybe that's not your cup of tea. Yeah, but well, there are people who can do both. Yes, can, you know. well, there's no one who mm -hmm. can do what you can do. You mentioned the fact that you were trained as a dancer. Mm -hmm. But then you walked away from that career. I didn't walk away from it at all. As the I say, walked I, away I, from I you. Was, yeah, no, I was, you know, sort of channeled into something else. I was never going to be a great dancer. I was too tall. I didn't have the training that I should have had when I was younger because of the war and so forth. But I might have gone on hoofing because I had to earn a living for some years more. But in Funny Face, you went back to dancing. Yes. Well, and you was danced fun. with the best. Was it at all intimidating? Were you, were you at all intimidated knowing what a, what a truly fine artist the yeah, stair well, was? I was terribly apprehensive about... I do remember the first time I met Fred Astaire and that was on the set. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, I, I had a very sort of uh, slim kind of... slender kind of technique. I mean, I didn't... I wasn't a great technician at all. And uh, to be, you know... Uh, cast opposite him was was terribly exciting, but I was very apprehensive. You see, the minute I walked on the set for the rehearsal, we just had a one working light and a piano player. And he was so dear and knew full well, I imagine, being a sensitive man, how I felt. But he was fun, made me relax, and before you knew it, then, there was some music going and he said, let's try a few steps and, you know, off we went. say I think I, I became very good friends with 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 Fred and I adored him and I was never ever scared of him after that first hour in Roman holiday did you have any sense when you were shooting it that this film would end up having such an impact on your career and on your no, work and then it not it, it at would... all I had no sense period <laughs> in those days I I was awfully new and awfully young and doing my very first big movie thrilled to be doing it but I was not even aware enough yet then of the significance of doing a picture for William Wyler, who William Wyler really was. 
I mean, I caught on very quickly. Yeah. I was very new to everything. I mean, only sort of it was only four years before that come out of Holland and a long German occupation, all of that, where we hadn't been able to keep up at all with, with pictures, and I was way behind, and there's so much I wasn't aware of, you know? So let alone think of me or a future, or I, I didn't know it was going to lead even to another movie. You've also talked about Weiler as the man who really discovered you. How did he first well, discover you? Where did he find you? And then what did he do to nurture you mm -hmm. and to help you along? He came to England looking for an unknown to do the picture. That's yes. what they had decided on which in fact was my only qualification for that picture. I was working in musicals. I just acquired an agent, or rather the agent had acquired me. <laughs> and I was doing little bits for television and in movies to, to, to earn an extra pound or two. Or a shilling in those days went a long way. And um, he really ordered a lot of tests made. And I was one of them. He did ask to see me. He met with me just a few minutes, just to sort of check me out, had me come to the hotel. I think he was staying at Claridge's in those days. And, uh, and then he left town. But he left me in the hands of a marvelous English director called Thorold Dickinson. When he directed this test, he was fully aware of the fact that I was petrified and didn't know how to go about the test or anything. And what he did do, which was very good and very clever and very fortunate for me is once I'd played my scene, which I did very badly and all of that, he just had me sit talking to, he was next to the camera like I'm talking with you now, and asked me questions about me or whatever I liked and disliked and, and um, I sort of forgot about the camera and talked with Thorold. And that's the test that eventually uh, won me the part and started, you know, a lovely career for me. There's a scene at the end of Roman Holiday, toward the end, where you have to cry. And mm -hmm. that, that that was difficult for you, that that was really a challenge for you. The, the last scene in the, pic in the picture was, in fact, the last scene we were shooting. It was done in mm -hmm. sequence for once. And if you remember, Greg and I have to say goodbye Yes. in the car. And that's it. We have to separate. And clearly, I was supposed to cry. And it was late at night, and I was tired, and I played the scene very nicely and everything. But tears didn't come, and I didn't know how to make them come. I hadn't ever tried or learned, unless they came perfectly natural, and nothing was happening. And Willie Weiler came over to our little car and gave me hell. <laughs> now, he'd always been so adorable and very gentle to me, and as I said, always bringing out the best in me and everything. He really let me have it, and I burst into tears when he shot the scene. <laughs> and, that and that's how he made me cry. Besides Weiler, there are one or two other people, uh, like Billy Wilder, like George Cukor, and you've talked about these three men as being the people who I think perhaps were more responsible for your career and for your work than any other directors. Yes, I always hate to say that one is more responsible than the other because uh, it's one thing to get me off to a great start. It also means a lot to keep you going. Yes, to sustain so, it to sustain, sustain it, yes, and I yes. have Stanley Donan to thank for that too, yes. and Blake Edwards, and Fred Zinnemann, and I can go on and on. And now, a Hollywood Minute from the pages of American Movie Classics magazine, a look at Robert Mitchum and his favorite leading ladies. Although they made only two films together, his kind of woman in Macau, Mitchum and Jane Russell formed a 40-year friendship and ignited a smoldering screen chemistry, one that will live in Hollywood history. 
But the voluptuous Russell was not Mitchum's only leading lady. In the locket, Lorraine Day set the stage for a string of dangerous female co-stars to follow. He made a toured match with Ava Gardner in My Forbidden Past. And Jane Greer made the most of what Mitchum's got in Out of the Past and The Big Steel. Mysterious and sexy, a real Hollywood he-man. Look for Robert Mitchum in these and other great classics this month on AMC. And for more on the stars, write for American Movie Classics magazine. Send 11.95 to P.O. Box 2065, Marion, Ohio, 43305. Or call 1-800-535-7700. American Movie Classics magazine, the magazine of classic Hollywood. One writer said Audrey Hepburn has probably worked with more great leading men in our generation than any other actress, and it may, it, it may be true. But what I wonder is that from your point of view, as you move from working from one truly great actor to another, must you in any way change your own rhythm, or your style of working, aside from the role? As I said before, I, I mean, I never really became an actress, <laughs> in the sense that when you ask me all those questions, my only answer is I wouldn't know. In the sense that, I, yes, I went from one picture to the other, from one director to the other, from one actor to the other. I just walked on the set, knowing my lines, and took it from there. Now, you say that you don't prepare for a particular person, which I understand. No. But for something like Wait Until Dark, another uh, one of my favorites. Now, surely for that yes. kind of role... Yes, but then it's not vis-a-vis -vis another actor, which I is what understand. you said. Now, now it's... Right. Now this, it's is to, this is to prepare to be the world's champion blind lady. Right. Now, how do you go about doing that? How do you, how do mm. you prepare yourself that to was, live in that world? Exactly. Well, it, that was a part that I was, you know, very happy to, 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 uh, to be given. But it did cause some anxiety for several weeks before we ever sort of started the picture because the studio did want me to be blind in some way and uh, or, or rather eager to either have me wear dark glasses or have a scar near an eye, you know, which worried me terribly because as I say, I'm not a sort of, I don't like for technique to show or even to be there. I also felt that this would draw attention to the fact that I'm not blind if you put makeup on somebody. So my hope was to do it from the inside out mm -hmm. and to somehow convince the audience who knew that, thank God, Audrey Hepburn is not blind, but that I, for, some, for a fleeting moment, could create an illusion of blindness. And two marvelous things happened. One was, I spent several weeks going every day to the lighthouse in New York, the institution for the blind. I was blindfolded and I learned what it meant technically to be blind. To go up and down in elevators, to find something you throw on the floor, to make a meal, to find things in a room. But then I had another extraordinary stroke of, of luck, I would say, but it was a blessing. I met a young girl who had, in fact, been blinded and in no time at all, I'm sorry that right this second I can't remember her name, I said, do something for me. Find your way around this room. And I sat on my chair and just watched her. She had beautiful eyes, dark, shiny eyes. There was no way of knowing that she couldn't see. So you don't need the but makeup and the dark glasses was one thing I realized. Yes. I don't want Gloria today. <coughs> don't need her. Yes, you do for your shopping. No. Nope. Gloria. Give me a hint. You can find it by yourself. If you couldn't, I'd tell you. What have you got against Gloria? A lot. The main problem is that she's in love with you, which makes me the villain of the feast. Susie, she's a kid. What are you left in front of you? I'd rather have a dog. What's clear to me is that in, in one or two interviews with this woman, that you picked up an enormous amount of material about the way it, she lived her life. It, I, I must quickly say, they weren't interviews. She, she became a friend. But you had an agenda, which was beyond the friendship you I wanted, wanted to, to understand. I wanted to rid myself of, 
of the technical side before I could play it. And that was being convincingly blind in my behavior. Right, right. And that I had a little bit with every part. What has always helped me a great deal, for instance, are the clothes. Because as I didn't have this technique of being able to deal with the part in, you know, however way it was, it was often an enormous help to know that you looked the part. Mm. Then the rest wasn't so tough anymore. What? But in a very obvious way, let's say, let's say you do a period picture, whether it was worn piece, when you wear high waists and little curls and crinolines and whatever, yes. or the nun story when you wear a habit. Once you're in that habit of a nun, it's not that you become a saint, <laughs> but you walk differently, you feel something. And it's also true if you've got rustling taffeta and, and a fan or whatever it is, yes. you walk differently, you sit differently, you've got all the stays, the, that is an enormous help. And also in, in the modern day pictures, wearing Givenchy's, you know, lovely, simple clothes. If I was wearing a jazzy little red coat and, and whatever little hat was then the fashion, I felt super. Mm -hmm. And it gave me the feeling of whoever I was playing in charade or breakfast at Tiffany or, or being, this, walking down those steps, stairs, for the first time, beautifully dressed in My Fair Lady. Now, actually, what you see is just a dress walking down the <laughs> in a sense yeah. that how could you miss? Yeah. The last time the audience saw you, you were grimy and couldn't speak properly in whatever it is. The scene is set up in a glorious way. The music, the, 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 the second that you don't see anybody. And around the staircase I come in this absolutely sublime white ball dress, which was a genuine one, by the way, which Cecil uh, Beaton had found. It was a, an antique. Yes. Made up, my hair dressed to kill, diamonds everywhere. All I had to do was walk down the stairs. <laughs> the dress that had made me do it. Too little, you look beautiful. Thank you, Colonel Pickering. Don't you think so, Higgins? Not bad. Not bad at all. Clothes have, as they say, they make the man, but they certainly with me have given me the confidence yeah. I often needed. Oh, when? Kitty. American Movie Classics presents Ginger Rogers in her towering, Oscar-winning performance. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, it's wrong. Wrong to be happy. The love that brings two people together. If I said I loved you as much as you love me, would, would that be enough? No, if that were true, there wouldn't be any love left for anybody in the whole world. The broken promise that tears them apart. Buy the girl a phony education and polish off the rough edges and make a mainline doll out of her. They always finish up by marrying one of their own kind. And through it all, there's Kitty Foyle. I'm going to have this baby. Judas Priest. Nobody owes a thing to Kitty Foyle. Except Kitty Foyle. Ginger Rogers and Dennis Morgan. Hooray for Kitty! Kitty for president! The undefeatable Kitty Foyle. Wednesday on American Movie Classics. You've done so much work in recent years for UNICEF. I mean, you've made it a personal mission. This is an organization that's about children all over the world. And I, I wonder how much of that has to do with what you went through in your own childhood. You grew up during the war. You grew up in an occupied country. You grew up with great hardship. And when you look back now on that, is there a thread that you think connects you with that little girl. I have never stopped to think if there's a connection or not. I mean, one doesn't go about one's own life that way. Maybe if I was writing a book, I'd have to think, yes. you know, how did it all happen? But if I'm with UNICEF, therefore, if 
I'm concerned about children today. It's still the same thread, if you want to call it, or reason, or quality, which I spoke about before with directors, with actors, with people, is that, yes, I went through a war. Surely that's made me a little more aware than some people might not have what it means to be hungry, deprivation, and so forth. Never do I think of that when I see a child in Africa who's at death's door. But what I've always had, and maybe that I was born with, was an enormous love of people, children. I loved them when I was little. <laughs> I used to embarrass my mother by trying to pick babies out of prams at the market and, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. The one thing I dreamed of in my life was to have children of my own. It always boils down to the same thing of not only receiving love, but wanting desperately to give it, enormous need to give it. It is true that I had an extraordinary mother. She herself was not a very affectionate person in the sense that I today consider affection. I spent a lot of time looking for it and I found it. She was a fabulous mother, but she came from an era, she was born in 1900, Victorian influence still, of great discipline, of great ethics, a lot of love within her, not always able to show it. I'm very strict. I went searching all over the place to find somebody who'd cuddle me, you know, and I found it in my aunts, in my friends. That is something that has stayed very strong. Maybe it's my nature. I don't know, maybe with a different mother, it'd still be the same. And out of that comes enormous concern. And that is the reason for which I could not possibly refuse to help a child if I can. You talked before about seeing a script to, let's say, wait until dark and wanting to do that part. Mm -hmm. But I understand that when you got the script for Breakfast at Tiffany's, that you had misgivings about that and that you did not leap into that project with quite the same enthusiasm. No. That is quite wrong. I had no misgivings. About breakfast at, at, at Tiffany's? Yeah. Some people around me had, but not me. Why did they have misgivings? Do you, do you remember? I don't know. I think for one thing, I don't think Truman Capote thought I was right for the part. And, uh, I don't know, I think sort of some people thought that, you know, it was a different era, that it was a bit daring to play a call girl. I had heard that there was one scene in Breakfast at Tiffany's that actually caused you some grief. I mean, it really was a problem for you. <laughs> right, it's the scene with the cat, because I'm a, I'm a, I'm putty about animals, you know, yeah. and I have, I have four dogs now, but I've had, I've had everything in my life, and it was awfully tough to throw that lovely marmalade cat into the rain. And in fact, it didn't want to get out of the cab, and I had to push it out and shout at it and no, everything. It's not. Holly? I'm not Holly. I'm not Lula May either. I don't know who I am. I'm like Cat here. We're a couple of no-name slobs. We belong to nobody and nobody belongs to us. We don't even belong to each other. Stop the cab. What do you think? This ought to be the right kind of place for a tough guy like you. Garbage cans, rats galore. Slam! I said take off! Let's go. But fortunately, I have the scene at the very end when I can go find it and hug it. And, and there was a marvelous cat wrangler to pick him up right <laughs> after the scene and, and give him some extra friskies or whatever they get. Being a legend, if you will, being someone larger than life, being a movie star, what's the downside of that? Are there moments when that lack of privacy ends up really being a disadvantage to you? when it really ends up being, frankly, a burden? Never a burden, and there isn't really a downside. Like in everything, there's, you know, you can find a, a problem. I think the only time it was a little hard for me was 
I think when my second son was born, and I was at that time living in Rome, and I could take him nowhere, not to a park, not down the street, not put him on a terrace without paparazzi. And that was very difficult because there again, it wasn't me, he's bothering the child, mm -hmm. you know, which really drove me mad. And as he began to be of an age, I could take him to the parks and everything because I lived in an apartment. To have photographers jump out from behind trees and he'd be in, <laughs> he'd be howling from, because he was so startled and that was very difficult. But then again, a dear friend who has a beautiful garden in Rome told me, bring your child here with other children as often as you want. I'd love to have them in the garden. You'll make me happy. So again, I was very lucky. So these are the little difficult moments that I've had. I can think of no downside. It has ended up that what you've given to people on the screen over the years is such a remarkable gift. Now I've got to be careful how I sound. I have an enormous love for humanity and the human qualities in people when they come out. That is perhaps what has come through off the screen to a yeah. public. All I can say for that gift, not for me, but for all of those other people together with me, is thank you. Thank you, and I thank them. <laughs>